Hello everyone. So the first step in setting up the dynamic loading kit for the first time is going to be to configure and set up your object which you'll be using with your work grid. Now in this tutorial series the objects I'll be using are Unity Terrains but it's important to note that using Unity Terrains is not a requirement. Uh, you can use Mesh Terrains or really any other game object with this kit. So I've gone ahead and I've sliced up the terrain to create my object group using the slicing tool. Now you may have created your objects with some other method. Perhaps you've imported them from Word Machine or some other program. Or maybe you're simply using primitive Unity objects. Either way, it doesn't matter. The one thing you will need to make sure of is that your objects follow the correct naming convention. When using the slicing tool, this convention is automatically followed so you don't need to worry about it. Uh, otherwise, you will need to and you will need to make sure your objects follow the convention. For 2D, uh, for 2D worlds, which we'll be using in this video series, the convention is group name followed by an underscore, followed by the row number, followed by another underscore, and finally the column number. Now the group name is simply the base name that all of your objects in your group will share, the name that they all have in common. Uh, this can be anything you want, it really doesn't matter. And it's basically everything that precedes the underscore row underscore column. For 3D worlds, it's a little different. You simply have a layer that goes first before the row and the column. Uh, but we're not going to worry about that for now. Since in this video series, we're only going to be working with 2D worlds. Now, the row is the position of the object within the group, either along the Z or the Y axis. More than likely, you're going to be using the Z axis. The only time you'd use the Y axis is if you were creating a 2D side scrolling game. However, in this case, we're going to be using Unity Terrains, which are always going to be using the Z axis for the rows. And you can identify the objects that are in the first row by looking at the Z value in the inspector on the transform of the object and finding the objects that have the smallest Z value. In this case, these objects have a value of zero. So these objects are on your first row. And you can see, because I've used the slicing tool, they already named correctly. So this is the first row. These objects here all have a value of 1, following that first underscore. And then the objects in the second row have a value of 2, third row, fourth row. And of course, you can have more than four rows, or you can have less. You could only have a single row. The column position is the position within the group of the object along the x-axis. And it doesn't matter what type of world you're creating, it's always going to be using the x-axis. Again, you can identify the first column by looking at each object and identifying the objects with the smallest x value. More than likely, uh, if you're using an orthographic view, which I do suggest, this will be the objects to the farthest left of your screen. Again, you can see here, they have a value of 1 for their column. Second, The objects in the second column have a value of 2. And then the objects in the third column have a value of 3. And a value of 4 for the objects in the fourth column. Again, you can have more columns, less columns, whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, now two things to note here. First is that we are using one-based indexing. So the first column, first row, have a value of 1 underscore 1. Uh, internally I use zero-based indexing. For anyone that's familiar with arrays and programming, you'll know why. The only time you really need to be concerned with this distinction is if you're extending the kit by creating custom components. Otherwise, you don't need to be concerned with this distinction. The second thing to note is that we are not 
preceding these rows and column values with zeros. That's very important. So if you have something like this, 0 over 3, that is not valid and it will screw with the kit. It will not work properly. So just make sure that you do not have any leading zeros preceding your row and column values. Once you've properly named your objects, you need to create prefabs from them. The easiest way to do this is to select Assets, Dynamic Loading Kit, Create Prefabs, which will open a window. We're going to type in the folder relative to the Assets folder where we want to save our prefab. So if you wanted to save them in the Assets folder, you can just type forward slash. Uh, in this example, I want to save them in a folder called Slices slash Resources. Um, it's a good idea at this point just to save them in a folder called Resources. Later on, we can change this if we don't need to have them in a folder called Resources. But you probably don't know what you want at this point. So it's a good idea just to put them in a folder called Resources and simply change it later if we need be. Another way to get the folder path is to right click your folder where you want to save the prefabs, select dynamic loading kit and copy relative folder path. And then if you're using Windows, select the, the field and hit control V. Or if you're using Mac, uh, I don't know what the command is for that. Basically you just want to paste the folder so once you've got your folder entered correctly, you want to select the objects in your scene hierarchy, and click Fill from Selection, and then click Create Prefabs. At this point, you can delete your objects from the scene if you want. I'm not going to. I'm just going to leave them there. Um, we've got our prefabs here. The final step is going to be to put these prefabs in a deactivated state. Uh, don't concern yourself with why this is necessary. I'll go into it a little bit in another video. What's important is to select all your prefabs, go into the inspector, find this little checkbox next to the blue cube, and uncheck it. And now our prefabs are in a deactivated state and that will conclude this tutorial. In the next tutorial video we'll be covering creating the world trade asset.